friends and welcome back to If Clothes Could Talk, a show where we uncover the beautiful, the slightly strange and the wildly fascinating world of fashion history. My name is Liv Hutley. I'm an emerging costume and production designer based here in Australia who's super keen to learn about the wide world of fashion history. And I am joined, as always, by thrift shop queen Ellie Gumpton, who is an emerging archaeologist and lover of old things generally. I got this, this dress from an upshop here, Janina. I, I, I figured. Um, I assumed. I assumed. <laughs> I love that for you. So today we are talking about very old things. We are talking about the Indus Valley civilization, but more specifically, the beginnings of the Indus Valley and how it has influenced fashion globally. So Ellie, can you break down the where and the when of this incredible civilization? Absolutely. So, the Indus Valley is in modern day Pakistan and was one of the first places to use cotton. It was one of the biggest early civilizations. The Indus Valley civilization lasted from about 3500 BCE to 1700 BCE. So we're looking at around 5500 to 3000 years ago. But of particular interest to us is the Indus Valley's amazing textiles and basketry and how they developed very fine and beautiful patterns that have been preserved in the figurines and pottery found by archaeologists. So for some context, Indus Valley is considered by many academics to be the beginning of modern civilization. So there are many theories on how a community or a village grows to be an empire, like Rome or Greece. Mm -hmm. Understanding the development of humans in the southwest area of Asia helps us tell you the story of how specialist craft was created and how fashion began. So Ellie, what was the vibe of this time? Like, How did the Indus Valley become a civilization? Yeah, so... Most people were still hunter-gatherers in 3500 BCE, though farming had been developing across different parts of the globe. That's not to say that hunter-gatherer is less than any farming, though, mm. because we are not about that unilinear theory of evolution. Anyway, we talked a little bit about this in our Utsi episode, if you guys want to go back and have a quick squeeze. But basically, gradually people transitioned to more sedentary living, domesticating crops and animals. Because finding food no longer took so much time and energy, there was more opportunity to participate in community activities and create. Experimentation began with technology and people began to specialize in certain areas, their craft becoming something worth trading for. The economy then kicks into gear. People are eating better because they have access to more food and have more children who live longer. The cycle expands and slowly the village becomes a town and the town becomes a city and the city becomes an empire. Trade with other communities promotes growth and a wider economy and a larger culture. Hierarchies are created and suddenly a small portion of the population hold the most important resources and therefore the most political influence in the town. Now this is just one theory as to how societies grow and develop. There are many others. But this theory that agriculture and subsistence farming develops communities into civilizations does fit quite well with Indus Valley. So the research on this topic has been fairly conclusive to say that the Indus Valley was one of the first places to intensify their agriculture and technology. And because of this became one of the first places with their own distinct sense of fashion, which is super exciting for us because it takes us back to some of the first origins of trends and unique style of communities. So Ellie, in some of our research that we did leading up to this episode, I kept hearing this term specialist craft theory. Could you break that one down for me? Yes, absolutely. So, fashion that we saw emerge in the IVC was helped along by the specialist craft theory and the dispersal of garments throughout trade. Specialist craft theory is what archaeologists call the assignment of specific tasks to specific people or subsets of people. So we see groups and communities creating in smaller groups, like little shops and things like that. But it isn't just physical garments that are traded between groups to disperse that fashion idea. It's then the exchange of ideas. And if you see from someone from the neighbouring town who's come in to trade some wheat and she's wearing a really neat hat and you think, gee, I That's like that hat. hat. I like that hat. That's a good hat. You're probably going to try and copy it or, or try to come up with your own variation on the style. And this still happens right now and you bet your bottom dollar it happened back then. And that's how fashion... Can, can disperse, but people can still have 
the same ideas in different places. But that's yeah. another story. Indus Valley was the perfect environment for fashion to grow, as fashion often does, a side effect of a growing culture and human experimentation with the new free time they got from not having to hunt a deer every day for tea. It does sound like a really hard task yeah. to just hunt a deer for your dinner. <laughs> so let's deep dive into what the clothing creation process looked like. The materials used to make clothing in the Indus Valley largely consisted of cotton and later silk. And the Indus Valley was the first place to domesticate cotton, which is like a big deal. It's a big deal. Most of the clothes that you and I wear now is made from a percentage of cotton. And the cotton was picked, hand picked, and then hand spun using a drop spindle, which you'll see later, or a spinning wheel, to make a really fine thread, which was then dyed and woven into a garment. But Ellie, how did they actually make it? Like, what was the process? Well, my friend, it's time to introduce you to my little, little pal, experimental archaeology. Ooh. Welcome, Ooh. friends, to a new segment that we like to call Liv and Ellie, Give It A Go. Ooh. <laughs> so today we are spinning Australian cotton. Yes. And that's, spinning Australian cotton. that's quite important to note before we get started showing you how it was made because the cotton that was present in the Indus Valley just doesn't really exist yeah. anymore. It's kind of been developed through yeah, farming. It's, it's now very domesticated. It's very domesticated rather than just a We little. can tell the difference between domesticated and wild because actually domesticated is often quite large. It's a yeah. lot more of the product and it's really interesting to have a look at things like wheat and grain to, to see the difference because people were so selective about what products they would pick and choose for their for their weaving for their eating they would often pick the bigger ones so yeah. they would breed the bigger ones and that's how we've ended up with more mm. on the stalk than previously so I ordered this on eBay. Seems Thanks, a little, eBay. Seems a little sketchy, but look, <laughs> just oh, it's a massive bag of cotton. I hope it's like some farmer's ten-year-old kid who's like, I'm just gonna go out and pick this stuff up off the ground, bag it, and sell it on eBay for like a hot ten dollars. You know what? I hope so too. I hope that kid enjoyed his ten dollars. All right, let's make. Let's make some thread. First, we need to to set to set up our station. So, wow! <laughs> Movie magic, hey! Movie magic. Movie magic. All oh, right. I've got cotton on me. Oh, love that for you. I mean, you do. Although this is quite. Yeah, this this feels more like polyester. It's, it's pretty. Me. It's pretty eighties poly. Yeah, I love that. Anyway, hello, hi, welcome to Live in Ellie. Give it a go. Um and. As you can see, we've got our cotton. And Ellie, can you please Do you tell want to break down stats? I want you to break down experimental archaeology first. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yes. So, experimental archaeology. Experimental archaeology is essentially when archaeologists try to replicate past practices like spinning cotton or making a stone tool, things like that. Mm -hmm. So when we try experimental archaeology, we are trying to look for the past practices, but we're also trying to look for materials that they would have used, processes, the debitage from it. So that's a that's a French word for rubbish. Rubbish. The trash. Um, the trash. Because if we find in a rubbish pit a certain amount of rubbish from a particular activity, we can go, ah, oh, they were doing this. Okay. So it gives us sort of a bit of an understanding and an appreciation of how these things worked. And for us, it's going to help us understand how these materials were made and how hard it was to make it. Mm, mm. Okay, so how did they make it? Let's okay. break it down. What is this? This is a spindle. So we've got one circular piece of wood speared by another smaller circular piece of wood with a hook in the top. So this is going to help us create the spin. Now there are two types of spin. There's the S spin and the Z spin. And we actually can analyze objects up really, really close. 
to find out if they were a Z spin or an S spin. So that basically just is saying which way the object was spun. So you've got to choose one way when you start out. So what we're going to do, we're going to get some cotton. We're going to tease it out because we want it to be nice and loose. Look at all these fibres. And we're going to loop it and hook it onto our spindle. Ooh, and this might come apart several times, but that's alright. We're gonna hook it and we're gonna spin it nice and carefully. Because we want to get that initial spin to be nice and strong because this is going to be the base for our spin. I'm just trying to get like a tiny bit. Like I just want a tiny bit of cotton. One so now single thread. I can drop it like that and it's spinning. And then I park it and then I'll tease out a little bit more cotton What's with my finger pinched. And then once I release this finger here it will spin all the way up the rest of the oh, okay. cotton. Spin. <laughs> oh, oh, I think I'm doing it. Oh you, you got it? You got, I got it? it? Okay. Oh, I'm going to spin it the wrong way. Oh, gosh. you got to pick one way. E oh, okay. Either way is fine. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> it's really hard. I think I'm getting somewhere here. Oh, my God. Oh. Thread. I'm starting again. <laughs> <laughs> There's not a soul out there, do, 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 do. no one to hear my prayer. <laughs> wow, that really helped. Give me, give me, give me a minute to midnight. Oh no! Oh, even, even the blessings of Abba could not. It kind of worked. I have a small piece of thread. Wow, look at that! That's okay, a long yeah, one. Right there. No, 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 no. <laughs> oh. It just kind of came undone. Well, that was a wild ride. We did not do that right. We did not do that well. Like, but I, I didn't even get enough that I could, like, wrap it once that around was the bottom of the spindle. Really hard. It's not easy. You no. Know? And people just did it. And spinning cotton into thread, it's just not easy. And no. it takes a significant amount of time, as we spent a long time just making our tiny little threads. And making textiles uh, back in the time of the Indus Valley was seen largely as a feminine task. So most of these textiles that they made were spun and created by women, which is a really great reminder, I think, to us that modern fashion, as we know it today, has been built on the literal backs of thousands of years of incredible female artists. Women are just... They're just the best. Just spectacular. Love it. Love them. Very cool. Whack it on a t-shirt. <laughs> yes, so these threads were not just spun, they were also dyed. And there were many colours involved in creating these textiles. And Dr. Kanoya, one of the leading researchers on the Indus Valley, has put forward a theory that there was a large indigo production happening in the Indus Valley. This would have taken quite a lot of time and people. The effort of making textiles was massive, and therefore clothing was expensive and a monetary commodity. You can check out a really great lecture from Dr. Kanoya on this topic via the link in the description down below. Ding! <laughs> so you're probably wondering what this thread and dye that we keep hammering on about eventually turned into, and what fashion actually looked like of the Indus Valley peoples. So we know what clothing probably looked like, uh, at this time, thanks to figurines and pottery patterns that have been excavated from all over the Indus Valley. So we have images of turbans, leggings, sashes, shawls that give us this kind of picture of fashion in the valley. So for example, check out this statue of what would have been a very wealthy man. It was initially thought that this was a statue of a priest, but then this was widely disputed in the academic community. Mm -hmm. uh, a little bit of academic tea there. But we know from an analysis of the surface that it was likely that the statue featured a red, white, and like a blue-black paint pattern. So we can assume that the clothing would have been of 
similar colours. Yeah, and what is also really interesting to note is that unlike our previous two episodes, people who had wealth dressed more for fashion than practicality. Mm -hmm. And we see a divide in the Indus Valley along hierarchical lines. People were able to gain significant wealth due to the development of agriculture and would display it in their clothing, being fashionable as compared to the less wealthy, the lower class who had to dress more for function. We have very little evidence of the lower class due to figurines typically being made of the wealthy, but we do know that there was a hierarchy and that this would have had an impact on fashion. And we can deduce popular patterns from the pottery and figurines, and we even know they dress their bulls and other livestock. I love that even, you know, five to 3,000 years ago, they were like, you know what we need to do? Dress up dress our pets. Dress our pets. We need to put our pets in cool clothes too. Me too. That's, that's the goal. <laughs> But whilst the pets were looking fresh, uh, another really important part of the Indus Valley look was jewellery and personal adornment. And we see a lot of evidence of this in so many of the statues. So there was a, also a popular style of short skirt with a belt and a sash and not too much else, which obviously we find a bit scandalous now. But back then, you got to understand that it was hot. Oh, yeah. It was really hot. Big time. And you had to dress for your climate, but also back then the religious connotations mm. and the social connotations of coverage would, would have been completely different. Yeah. And it's hard to know what the expectations mm. were. Hair and headdresses were also a really big part of what we see in these figurines, so it might be concluded that this was also an important part of your, your daily look when you're in the Indus Valley. So to conclude if we can conclude. Yeah. Fashion was detailed and an expensive process 5,000 years ago. And as Liv and I hopefully demonstrated, it was and still is a skilled labor that many women partook in. We hope that you have learned a little bit more about the Indus Valley fashion and why fashion was able to develop so strongly and in such a detailed way in this region. Yes, thank you so much for joining us. But before we go, we would like to acknowledge that we are living and creating on stolen land. And we'd like to further pay our respect to the traditional owners and custodians, the Turrbal and Yagara people in what is now called Brisbane, and the Bidjigal and Gadigal people in what is now called Sydney. We pay respect to elders past, present and emerging. Sovereignty was never ceded. Well, that's all we have time for. If you want more historical content, you can find us on Instagram. We are at If Clothes Could Talk AUS. And if you have a question or a couple of suggestions, you can email us at If Clothes Could Talk at gmail.com. And we have a podcast. We do! It's really exciting. It's really funny. You can <laughs> check that out in a link in our description and listen to it. And remember to like and subscribe to get notified when our next episode comes out and ring that bell. Ring it. Ring the ring bell. Ring it. <laughs> Until well, next time.